Hi guys, it's Camille here and I'm coming to you with, yes, you got it right, with another International Booker Prize review. For those of you thinking, Jesus, when is he going to be done with it? I can only have one answer. There's no end in sight. No end in sight. <laughs> okay, I'm teasing you. There's only seven books left. And thank you all for being with me on this journey. Thank you for all the likes, comments and subscriptions. That really means a lot. And as you already figured out, today it's time for Till by Daniel Kelman, translated by Ross Benjamin. Now not only longlisted, but also shortlisted for International Booker Prize. And I don't know if you know, this is also a Netflix series in the making. We will start with the historical background. The plot of the novel is set during one of the deadliest and one of the longest wars in modern history, the Thirty Years' War, a war fought between Catholic and Protestant states of Europe from 1618 to 1648. Started as a local conflict, as they often do, the Thirty Years' War eventually drew in the great powers of Europe, resulting in one of the longest, most destructive and deadliest conflicts in European history. It is estimated that the war was responsible for the death of 8 million civilians and military personnel alike, which amounted to 1.4% of the world's population. Just to compare, the First World War, with all modern weaponry, killed 1.7% of the world's population. The origins of the war, the Thirty Years' War, were rooted in the Protestant Reformation, so the war had a religious background. But let's go back a few years, just for a sec. In 1555, after years of Catholics and Protestants killing each other in the name of God, the Peace of Augsburg was signed introducing the rule Cuius Regio, Eius Religio, which translates as whose realm, his religion. So whoever reigns, the official religion of a country is the one the monarch subscribes to. We have to remember that the novel takes place in the Holy Roman Empire, don't be confused with the name. The Holy Roman Empire existed till 1806 and it was sort of a federation of mostly German countries with their own kings and queens under the leadership of a Kaiser. Kaiser is German for Caesar. That federation was a mixture of Protestants and Catholic states, but also often states that were within their own borders a mixture of both Catholics and Protestants. Let's assume now that you are a powerful noble living in such a kingdom and you hear about this new rule. Who's on the throne? It's his religion that dominates, right? What would you do then? You either make sure that the king issues the law that gives you the right to practice your own religion or you talk with your pals and think about the plan how to make sure that the throne of the kingdom well, the kingdom you live in is hitting the backside of a king that shares your religion. If you are thinking that kingdoms are passed from father to son, that happens only in hereditary monarchies. While already back then, in the 17th century Europe, a lot of kingdoms weren't hereditary monarchies, but elective ones, where nobles following the laws of the country were electing kings. The Kingdom of Bohemia was a Protestant country that lost its right to practice Protestantism. So in 1618, during a dispute in the local Bohemian chancellery, between the Catholic representation of Kaiser and Protestant nobles, the Catholics were thrown out the window, demonstrated in fancy words. They didn't die. And what's mentioned also here in this novel Catholics explained it as an intervention of God. They were saved because of angels helping them to fly down intact, obviously. Or, if you want to believe Protestants, they lived because they fell on a big pile of shit. 
we would never know what happened, right? <laughs> Following that, the Bohemian Protestants offered the crown to Frederick V of the Palatine, the husband of Elizabeth Stuart, both of them known in the novel as the Winter King and the Winter Queen. Why winter? Because it took Habsburgs that were ruling the Holy Roman Empire only a few months to throw them out of Prague. So Frederick and Elizabeth enjoyed their kingdom only for one winter. This is how the Thirty Years' War started. Catholics, Habsburg and their coalition against Protestants, at least initially, as the religious world turned quickly to a political one, where the religion of a kingdom didn't necessarily mean any longer the same alliance. For instance, Catholic France was supporting Protestant Sweden fighting Catholic Habsburgs. You know, the balance of power became more and more important. Okay, let's stop here in terms of history and let me talk about how all of that is intertwined into the novel. The main character of the novel is Till Ullenspieger. Historically, the protagonist of a German chapbook published in 1515. In German tradition, Till was presented as a jester who challenged the social order, playing jokes, exposing vices of human nature, mostly greed, hypocrisy and foolishness. Very much so as the 17th century Till in Daniel Kalman's book. Here, in this novel, Till is a son of a miller, Klaus Ullenspiegel, Till's father, Klaus, is a free thinker, a local healer, an educated man so hungry for knowledge that he would rather spend days solving mysteries of the world than taking care of the meal. Thirty Years' War was also a period where hunting for riches picked up in Europe once again. Jesuits' Inquisition was spreading the word of God once again, and Till's free-thinking, curious father fell victim to it. Having no home, after Inquisition's warm hands took care of Till's father, Till and the local girl, Nella, ran away to become the traveling people, traveling jesters, and protected by any law, as this is the price you pay for freedom. Till from then on becomes sort of a commentator of events. As a court jester, he has the right to laugh in the king's face, shredding the illusion of grandiose, showcasing the true nature of the world around. In parallel, we are introduced to the life of the Winter King and the Winter Queen, Frederick of Palatine and Elizabeth Stuart. Till's life and those two will be intertwined throughout the novel. Till and the Winter King, the jester by profession, and Frederick, the laughingstock of Europe, both supported by strong women, Nella and Lise, the lives as mirror reflection. The narration of this novel is non-linear. The novel opens with an unnamed narrator, a victim of a Thirty Years' War, being at the same time a member of a village community that falls victim to Till Ullenspiegel's trickery. Kelman in two opening paragraphs sets the scenery of the whole novel, informing the reader that there's a war raging and that the narration will draw abundantly from German folklore and myths and be strongly affected by Christian piety. The first paragraph talks about a raging war and the second one about the prayers villagers offer to Christian saints as well as the Lady of the Forest and the Little People of Midnight. After this chapter, the novel continues mostly in the third person, but the war will continue being the driving force of the events, while the mixture of Christian piety and magical thinking will continue being the forces initiating the course of the events and steering them subsequently. Reading this novel, I felt the echoes of Italo Calvino, especially when the cruelty of war was being described. Kalman, in a similar fashion to Italo Calvino's Our Ancestors trilogy, describes the war, going from brutal descriptions of horrors of war to dark humor a few pages later. Let me read you one of the descriptions of cruelties of war. 
Here the king saw something horrible. He looked at it, didn't realize at first what it was. It defined recognition. But when you looked at it longer, it took shape and you understood. He quickly looked elsewhere. It was dead children, probably none of them older than five, most of them not even a year old. They lay there heaped up and discolored, with blonde, brown and red hair, and when you looked closely, many pairs of eyes were open, forty or more, and the air was dark with flies. When they had passed, the king was tempted to turn around, because even though he didn't want to see it, he did want to see it, but he resisted the temptation. Daniel Kelman is showing the world where science mixes with magic. People considered educated historical figures like Athanasius Kircha, Jesuit scholar who in his works crosses back and forth between science and magic, working in fields of medicine, geology, or trying to decipher hieroglyphs, but also seeking dragons, believing in supernatural qualities of their blood, in his convoluted logic, Kirscher explains at what point in this novel that since in given location nobody ever seen a dragon, the dragon needs to exist in that area, as dragons are known to be champions of camouflage, so if a dragon wasn't spotted there, it must exist there. If it was spotted, it wouldn't be a real dragon, so all areas where the dragons were reported to be seen are automatically out of interest for this scholar. One of the most amusing parts comes when, after a year of studies, he finally believes that he deciphered Egyptian hieroglyphs. But when scholars from the Middle East demonstrate to him that his method is inconclusive, showing him the writings from other tomes, he just comments that this only proves that those particular ancient writings were written by some uneducated scribes. So, you know, that ancient Egyptian scribe made a mistake. Not he, Athanasius Kirscher. <laughs> Bending and twisting the laws of logic just to have them still supporting one's position, you know, it does ring a bell, right? Interestingly, uh, this characteristic of twisted logic is the most visible in Jesuit scholars of that era, historical figures the author introduced to this novel, fortunately most of them forgotten right now. Kelman seems to be showing how religious piety was clouding the scientific pursuits. Athanasius Kircher was involved with Jesuit Inquisition trials as well, also in this novel. The same trials that sentenced to death Giordano Bruno or prisoned Galileo. And as a result, Jesuit scientists, just like Kircher, were, we might say, opposed by the scientific world back then. 17th century is the era of Newton, Descartes or Leibniz, the men of science and reason, and those men, due to Kircher's conflicting, often overshadowed by religious fundamentalism pursuits, often were in opposition to him, and Kircher, one of the biggest name of 17th century science, is today almost totally forgotten. Let's look once again at his dragons. Yeah, pretty. It almost feels like Kalman was drawing the parallel with the current world where we nowadays often see, I mean, fortunately it's a tiny percentage, but still, we see some lunatics with scientific titles paid by politicians and corporate lobbies denying what overwhelming majority of science is saying. This novel also shows the failure of memory, exposing various points of view of the same events and contrasting them with each other. But this is also a novel where the fallacy of certainty is being exposed. Athanasius Kircher, the Jesuit scholar, his writings are predicted to be widely read till the world exists. Yeah. Another fallacy. German language that is only shaping up back then is thought not to be the language predestined for poetry or literature. There are jokes being made when literature in German is mentioned. I mean, tell that to get a real color man, right? Um, this is also the world where almost every other language is better understood than English, where the nobles of European countries meet to negotiate the peace. 
know, especially now when we are experiencing the freeze of the world as we know it, this type of a novel hits especially hard. Even though we live in a completely different world, we as humans keep on thinking in a similar fashion, especially believing that the world as we know it, as we organize it, will forever continue. And we also have a ruling class supported by the middleman that would bend every truth to keep the status quo. When I read about the world that doesn't exist while the rules of it were the modus operandi for centuries, I was thinking that maybe, maybe we are experiencing another shift starting now. Even if human life is too short to see it fully, most probably in a couple of hundreds of years, the future society will read about us thinking, what the hell those guys were doing, right? Well, yes, I enjoyed it very much. Okay, guys, have a beautiful Easter or Passover or any other holidays, if you celebrate any. If you don't, just have a brilliant weekend. And I'll be back with you in two days with Mac and his problem. Bye-bye.